Hello, this is another episode of Cyber Coast to Coast. I'm Scott Schober here on the East Coast out of our headquarters at Berkeley Veritronics, Metuchen, New Jersey. I'm joined by my brother, Craig. How you doing, Craig? Hey, I'm doing great. And I'm out here on the West Coast in Long Beach, California. Um, what do we got for today? Yeah, we got, we got three great stories just to give it the quick rundown to kind of whet everybody's appetite. The first story comes from us uh, from The Verge, which is a great source for some of these stories that are a little more edgy. It talks about fake cheating sites that are the latest ri- risk for remote students. So something that uh, students where they're, where they're taking tests, we'll dive into that a little bit remotely. What are some of the risks of doing that and the implications if you're cheating? Uh, the, the next story is coming from the New York Times. This is a crazy one. I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to get into it because it's just so wacky. Justice Department seizes $3.6 billion in Bitcoin and the arrests of a married couple. And this married couple is just off the rockers. And I think I'd love to hear your take on this as we dive into this story because it just makes me laugh. And the third story is coming from the Hacker News, um, a tool that can retrieve pixelated text from redacted documents. I love this one. I think it's really cool. And and in fact, I talked about this. Actually, I'm going to be talking about this uh, Monday morning on uh, in the headlines of Cybercrime Magazine. So it's kind of coincidental um, discussing this today in a little bit more detail. And again, I'll be covering this topic as the headline, cyber headlines on Monday morning. Uh, with Cybercrime Radio. So uh, those are the three headlines. But before uh, we dive in, I wanted to just share with everybody, our our listeners, and we we thank you for listening. And to mention that this episode of Cyber Coast to Coast is brought to you by Cyberlytica, providing proactive cybercrime intelligence. To learn more about Cyberlytica, visit cyberlytica.com. And I was thinking right before we dive into these three great stories here, um, I wanted to chat with you a little bit because you kind of mentioned, but I didn't get the details. So this is going to be a little bit new to me as well to our listeners, but um, that our company BVS, we were dealing with a uh, kind of a, I call it a vendor scam with some stuff that was going on. And I was wondering if you could set the background and and share some of it because it did involve uh, PayPal, which is something that we regularly use as a business. And, and normally I tend to, to preach to people that PayPal is safe and um, wanted to get your thoughts on what's the scam, what happened on Furled, and uh, maybe a- a- afterwards we could share some of the uh, action items, if there's any tips or things that, that people can look at if they're buying things through eBay and using PayPal. Yeah, sure. Um, I, uh, in the past, you know, we, we authored three books so far, working on our fourth, and uh, one of the services that I uh, appreciate, um, I found on Twitter, there's several vendors that provide this service, but you know, they basically connect readers with authors and they, uh, on the, on the promise that they'll, you know, you, they give the book to the reader for free and the reader will provide a review and post it on Amazon or Goodreads or Barnes and Noble or wherever. And I've used this service in the past and it's great. You, you know, you, you pay a sum of money and they're not, you're not paying for reviews. You're paying for real readers and that's, you know, you hopefully you get what you uh, pay for. But in this case, I used the service that, you know, they had they had enough followers. I thought they, were, they seemed legitimate. I found them on Twitter like I, I found the other one in the past um, and they offered a really good deal. And it wasn't it wasn't an amazing deal. It wasn't too good to be true type of deal. So I figured, OK, it's safe to trust it. But they just had, you know, I was finding they had terrible after months and months. I should have we should have already had dozens of readers and dozens of reviews posted. I I only had like one or two and uh, I kept asking them what's going on, you know, and they, they were having, they kept claiming to have problems. They changed, you know, and all the payments were done through PayPal, uh, which is, you know, fine. Uh, But um, they, they kept, uh, they, they actually changed their name of the company so that that changes kind of the PayPal source. So they refunded me all my money back. And then I gave them, and then I repaid them back you know, I, my lesson is I, 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 I think I uh, applied a little too, bit too much trust in this company, especially after they had very poor communication and just poor results, you know, ultimately. But, but anyway, um, 
I contacted PayPal after a long time, they wouldn't refund my money. I, I asked them, okay, this service is just taking too long. I'm not happy with it. You said you have a, a you know, full refund guarantee. So I'm asking for that. And they said, okay, a few more days, a few more days. And I started to notice that all of the days, the times they said, well, we'll have this processed in 10 days maximum. And I started looking at PayPal's um, policies and, and, and PayPal said, well, if you, if, if something is in process within a certain amount of days from the original purchase, then we, it's a harder to refund you. And also this company said, well, we can't, uh, we can't refund you because uh, you have to um, uh, pause or you know, cancel your claim with PayPal because I, I made a claim with them um, because I had, there was no other recourse because the company wasn't really responding and you know, I wasn't seeing the money back in the account, obviously. So it's funny how, if you look at PayPal's policies, this is where I probably made my biggest mistake. You look at PayPal's policies, they say, once you, once you uh, cancel a, a claim, you can't re reignite it. You can't, you know, reclaim the same uh, thing. Yeah. But like a, like a dope, I, I put a little too much trust in this company and said, well, you know, I guess I'll have to, I'll have to stop it and then they'll pay me and this will all be over and fine. So of course what happens, I, uh, go through, I do what they say and canceled it. And then, then the communication got really sparse and they wouldn't, you know, then they're not re responding to anything. I, I sent them, uh, you know, direct messages on Twitter. I found their email, sent them emails and they kept giving me weird excuses. So finally I went back to PayPal and said, look, you know, this, this company's a scam. I want you to know about it. And, you know, even if, even if I can't get my money back, I want to, I want this company, you know, a red flag on them uh, because they're scamming other people, obviously. Um, but, it, pay, but PayPal came through and they said, you know what, we're going to reopen this case. I talked to a, you know, a PayPal operator and, um, one, one of the things, uh, just so I don't forget one of uh, the tips I could write off hand is say, always use, um, try to use a, a PayPal business account as opposed to PayPal personal, because when you use a PayPal business account, they, you know, unfortunately, uh, fortunately for us, but unfortunately for users that you know have personal accounts, yeah, they, they, um, you know, they they take you much more seriously, and they they give you um, the benefit of the doubt as a as a vendor or a buyer in you know when you're when you're doing a a business account, and I know this from experience because I've had other issues with PayPal as because I have a personal account and a business account and you know, the, the way they treat you is night and day and they provide insurance and on those type of things also with the business, uh, which, which is great, but you know, long story short, too late. Uh, <laughs> we got our, we got the money back. Uh, so I'm happy about that. And now I'm going to go to the, um, review provider, uh, that I have used in the past and trust. Um, and before I forget, let me just, let me just mention that, uh, let's see, it's, uh, readers, yeah, readers how readers tweets. Sorry, uh, at readers underscore tweets. Those are the bad guys. <laughs> do not do business with them. I mean, I'm sure we have authors uh, listening to this podcast. If you want this, it's a great service when it works. But if you want to use this service, do not use uh, readers dot under you know underscore tweets. Uh, also known as Reader's House is the the name of their in their Twitter thing. But I will say the good ones, the guys I do trust, are uh, book book tasters at book tasters and book tasters is their name also on Twitter. So I would I would highly recommend them, and I hope you know our listeners will give them business. Yeah, and I, I think that's great that you um, we go out on a limb a little bit and share with people who are honest and who are dishonest because it, it just helps sharing that information. Oftentimes when I'm hesitant, if something's legit or a scam, I will go on Google and put the name of the company in and scam. And sometimes it's interesting because other people have shared, Hey, don't trust this company. It's a scam or, or, you know, avoid this one. I was duped up, up, up. So you could save yourself a lot of time and money just by taking the time out. And run it through a quick search, see what other people have. So I think the more we share information, it starts to make me think it'd be a great site. And maybe there is a site out there where that just 
shares people's true experiences. And as long as that's not manipulated and submitted and, and somewhat vetted, it, it does let the consumers, it reminds me of, a, I guess, in the early days of Angie's list or even Craigslist or different things that there was some, mm-hmm. there was some level of confidence in it before all the world of scammers hit all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned the uh, that you you know you Google stuff for scams. I do that too all the time because that kind of brings me to the almost a part two of this story, which <laughs> which came about. It's not related, but it kind of is. But it's another scam, and it involves PayPal. Um, the uh, apparently I, I've been doing some purchasing on eBay, and somebody must be shadowing my purchases and watching it because minutes after I made a large purchase on eBay, uh, our, uh, HR department at Berkeley, uh, gets a call. I think it was, I don't know. I don't know if she talked live to anyone or if it was recorded message. I'm not sure the details exactly, but she writes to me saying somebody from PayPal just called and wants to confirm your payment. Cause it's a, to them, cause it's a large payment and here's their phone number. And I thought that's, that's really weird. They never, they don't do things by phone like that preemptively or anything. You know, you have to report the fraud to PayPal. They don't proactively say, Hey, that's a big purchase. You know, yeah. what are you, what, what are you doing? What was the size? What was the rough oh, it, dollar volume of the purchase? Was it, it was about, it was about $2,000. Okay. So it wasn't that unordinary for, for typical purchases that, that we make as a company. Interesting. Yeah, it was on the it was on the larger side for probably the average PayPal purchase, but our company purchases, yeah, probably fall in there somewhere. Um, but I thought it was, you know, peculiar, and that's why I immediately um, typed in the phone number uh, that uh, was relayed to me by our uh, by Cynthia, our uh, HR department, and um, and you know wrote scam or something like that after it uh, into Google. And uh, immediately it came up with a whole bunch of links saying, if you get this phone number, if somebody says to call this number back, don't bother. It's a scam. Don't, don't try it. And I found several examples uh, of people, you know, relaying their stories about how they were scammed or they avoided a scam. So, um, you know, like you said, that's one of the, it's one of the simplest, but biggest pieces of advice it's like where true crowdsourcing is a real like blessing on the internet you you go if you have any questions about anything almost you just type in the question into google and if somebody had an issue with them somebody had a history with them you're going to see it posted somewhere and so that will give you a basis on you know what you what you think your next move should be yeah Yeah. and i I think it's interesting You, you the I guess consumers still need to use some level of caution because <laughs> we know that reviews and postings and things like that sometimes are manipulated and sometimes fake. However, I think if you get a general pulse or feeling and you you read something and it talks about a scam, especially when they go into detail, hey, it was this amount, you know, it, there was a sense of urgency to it. Here's the way they respond. And if you see a similar pattern, you kind of prove to yourself, hey, this is actually a credible posting about a scam. So you need to do your, your detective work. And I think that's true with all things with cyber and scams. Uh, oftentimes, the important thing, you have to stop, back up from it, and, and just kind of reason on it. And, and if you think about it, what, what Cynthia did was the perfect thing. She stopped. She sent the information to you. Instead of responding right away, when we stop and get a second source or a third source just to validate, hey, am I crazy? Are, are you making a purchase of this amount here or there? It suddenly breaks down um, a lot of the tactics that scammers use, which is kind of like pushing that time is of the essence and you got to do it before it's too late and the pressure of something. Um, and we've all fallen victim to it. So I think it's important that we just slow down, analyze it, ask for help, verify before we start to trust. Yeah. And it's also important, important when you're making per any purchases on eBay, um, you got to look at how many, um, sales they've made, how many transactions this, you know, this anonymous person has made. You got to look at their country of origin. Some countries have more scams than others. You got to look at their return policies, you know, their ratings from, uh, other, all these other transactions they've had, read, read a couple of them to get a pulse on what, you know, just what you're getting into, because 
I, you know, I'm always looking out for scams and yet I've been scammed. So if it can happen to me, it can happen to just about anyone, I suppose. And I think there's also a new wave of things. It's not, I shouldn't say new because it's been going on a long time, but maybe newer in the happenings of the electronic industry, as far as components and integrated circuits, there's a high percentage of fraudsters selling items that are really counterfeit parts. So they look, feel like legitimate parts. You see the, you know, the silk screen on top of the integrated circuit and the number of pins and maybe even the packaging, the pictures they associate, but they're not sold through authorized channels and distributors. And, and I think people need to be really cautious there. And, and this is really driven in part COVID, the shortages of cars with all the electronics and cars and consumer goods like computers and phones and everything else. And, and the, the supply chain problems, when you add up all of those things to, to buy components to build circuit boards now that go into any type of electronics is not just something where it's just in time, you can buy it and ship it next week. It's taking six months or taking a year or longer in some cases for certain key components. Um, that's driving a lot of the scammers to to an eBay or even to Amazon. I've seen where they pretend that they've got legitimate sources and all they're looking to do is, is steal your money, sell you, you know, either get your credit card or send you and sell you counterfeit parts by the time you get them and try them. Cause you got to still take these parts and put them into your, your production cycle and get them soldered. It may take a couple of months by the time they got your money, you get the parts and it's actually on a finished tested board. It may be half a year or a year later and it's too late to go back after them because they're long gone. So, you know, use caution, everybody out there. Absolutely. Well, let's let's stop talking about our scams and cybersecurity stories and get into some of these stories here. Yeah, uh, what, what's the first one you got? This first one, I think, is really interesting. Fake cheating sites are the latest risk for remote students. A lot of students are still working remotely with the world of COVID. Some are slowly getting back to universities and schools. So um, now, now is certainly an appropriate time for a story like this. And what they talk about, and you're probably familiar with the term uh, honeypot in the world of cybersecurity, something that's used to, to lure somebody in to fool, fool a victim. Well, it, it kind of plays into this nicely here. And, and according to this uh, report here, um, they, they talk about how they use a, a fake answer site on the internet there to tempt and catch students who are trying to cheat it to, on an online exam. So you've got students that are kind of remotely working, they're given an exam. And, and what, do, what do students typically do? They'll, they'll grab another device even, they'll grab their phone or tablet discreetly, and they're gonna look it up. So they may be on camera, it may be a virtual classroom where you know the proctor could see them that they're taking the class, be it on their computer or a physical piece of paper, it doesn't matter. But they're, they're glancing down and looking at specific answers. And they, and they brought out some, some interesting things here. So these are actually a company that developed these honeypot sites that these are websites that are set up. So when there is an online exam going on, the data from the, the, the student's software that's administering the test or whatever, they can actually get statistics back. And that's really scary when you think about it. And they could see that, ooh, they're doing a search right now trying to get an answer for this particular thing. And they know the student's whereabouts, where, you know, maybe the IP of the IP address of where they're residing, where they're doing the work from taking the exam. And now they can also see if there's another IP address for another device that's looking for something similar. So it's interesting how they're using uh, this information and kind of spying on people to catch cheating students there. It's, it, it almost makes you wonder, is it, a form of entrapment. I, you know, we watch shows on TV. I, I like cops, for example, we watch a lot of those and they'll mm -hmm. send out somebody to pretend to sell drugs. And then they nail the, the guy buying the drugs. And it's a little bit of a sense of entrapment, but it's used to keep honest people honest and the criminals off the street and lock up the bad guys. And here they're trying to keep students honest and catch, catch the bad students. Well, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, the, the service, um, this company is called Honor Lock. And initially what they provided was um, 
I believe they, they use your, you know, it's all, um, the students are all, uh, kind of, it's an opt-in thing. So when you're taking yeah. your online testing, your webcam or, you know, whatever cameras built into your computer is looking at the students kind of to, and using artificial intelligence to make sure they're not doing suspicious things like looking, you know, it's looking at the gaze, looking at your, where you look, you know, are you looking down at your phone? Are you looking, you know, where are your eyes going? Are you looking at something else? And that's, and that flags them as a potential cheater. And I don't have a problem with that so much as I do with these honeypot things, because it really right. does feel like entrapment to me. Um, I don't know. I, I could see me like, I, I don't consider myself a cheater, but if something came up the way, the way it was pre presented in the story, it said, you don't know the answer to this. Would you like to see the real answer? I'm yeah. just curious. And I'd be like, well, I, I just really want to know what the right answer is. Like, I don't, you know, I wish there was a way to not include, you know, once I get the right answer, they could remove that question from the test and just give me another one or something like that, just because I'm, I'm curious about it. But, um, I don't know. I almost feel like it's, it's a bridge too far by creating honeypots and turning these, turning students into suspects. You know, it seems like something more, um, for just straight on, you know, law enforcement than cheating right. students. <laughs> and it does, it does seem almost the premise that it's guilty before proven innocent. Assume that every student's going to cheat. Right. Let's put some honey pots. Let's lure them in. Let's use automation and remote testing software to, to nail them and, and sort through and send them a message. The part that was a, a kind of a standout to me also that how widely spread the service was used. It mentioned in the article there in that Verge article, over 300 educational institutions. And they had mentioned right. of a few of them, University of Florida, Arizona State, University of Maryland, University of Boston, Massachusetts. So these are some, some big, well-known uh, universities that are using this technology. Um, and, and I guess if I, I reflect back, go back about 10 years ago, when we really started getting in heavily involved into this little niche of catching cheating students, I remember we were approached, our company, by uh, somebody that was administering exams. And they said they have a high uh, percentage of students that will whip out their phone and do a quick Google search or text a friend to get a quick answer. And it's becoming a problem. And, and in fact, that was really the genesis of our product called the Pocket Hound, a little low cost uh, uh, covert cell phone scanner that simply had LEDs light up and it would vibrate as you get closer to a transmitting cell phone and proctors of exams would covertly put these in their pocket and just walk up and down the aisles. If it started vibrating in their pocket and they glanced down and saw the LEDs as they got closer to their target, they, they would usually catch a student that was glancing down at their cell phone and trying to cheat. And uh, I remember even it was kind of kind of fun. You, you may remember that day we got visited by uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what the network was ultimately, but I think it was CNBC that they did an entire documentary on uh, catching mm. cheating students. Yep. And we were part of it, talking about the technology, the techniques of catching people that are using uh, mobile phones. And it, it was really fun. And then to see the research from universities like Rutgers and other experts in the field that talked about the problem of uh, the, the high, high percentage of students that are actually cheating on tests was an eye opener to me. Um, so it's yeah. so kind of a cool article nonetheless. Yep. That's yeah. I saw that and immediately thought of pocket hound and I think it was, I don't know if it was the CBC, the Canadian broadcasting company Remember, It ended up in their documentary. Yeah. They all, an interview. It. Yeah. They okay. In turn licensed it. And um, it went to, I think it was CNBC ultimately that produced right. the segment and carried it. And they, they aired it 20 times or something like that through a couple seasons. It was really really a neat uh, investigative piece, I guess you could say. But initially it was a company out of uh, Canada that actually produced it. And they in turn approached uh, a major network and, and pick, they picked it up, which was great. So uh, hopefully they made money on it and, and did well. I think we were actually compensated a dollar. They have to exchange <laughs> some, some money. For, I remember we got a, a check for a dollar and I was like, this is very strange. But for us, obviously we're not, we were not trying to, um, make money from the production indirectly we we did because we we've sold thousands of pocket hounds mm -hmm. uh, as a result in part because of that great documentary and just making the 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 um the concept go viral that 
hey, you can use a tool such as a pocket hound to catch cheating students in high schools and in universities or around the globe. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. Yeah. All right. So um, what else we got on the agenda? What's the next story um, here? Yeah, the, the, the next story, this this is, again, one that, that made me laugh, but just as a maybe a reminder for our, our great listening audience there that this episode of Cyber Coast to Coast is brought to you by Cyberlytica. They provide proactive cybercrime intelligence. So to learn more about Cyberlytica, we encourage you to visit cyberlytica.com. Yeah, this next one was an interesting story from the New York Times. It was actually picked up by all the major media outlets, in part because it was such a... Um, a large, large heist. It, it talks the, the title of it is Justice Department seizes $3.6 billion in Bitcoin and arrests a married couple. Um, now that, that headline in itself, I think there could be a sub headline. This is the wackiest married couple I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were really accused of conspiring to launder Bitcoin. And this was stolen back in the 2016 Hong Kong based firm, uh, uh, Bitfinex and one of the largest uh, uh, virtual currency exchanges. And, and the part that really I don't understand, I'm still trying to decipher it because I, I was laughing so hard. It's a young couple. They were in their early 30s and they, they, they I guess, lo- were laundering this, uh, you know, almost 120,000 Bitcoins. And that, that was back in 2016. I didn't do the conversion, but um, since then, we know Bitcoin is, 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 rocketed i forget up to 60 65 thousand dollars then it backed off into the forty thousand dollar per per bitcoin so you're talking about a lot of money here a lot of a lot of coins and that's why 3.6 billion dollars it's just phenomenal um but tell me about the the rap video craig you you know videos and you you've actually edited videos in the past when i saw the rap video (laughs) that she put out i was dumbfounded spirit of a revolutionary power of a dictator love to be contrary but i'm fly like a gator i've got pilot blood i'm a real risk taker pirate riding the flood badass money maker grandmother crocodile weirder than an x-file free fire silver. so sexy when i slither sparkle on my little finger hell of a razzle ear to ear poised to throw a zinger playing on their worst fear russell kong the versace better win yeah, um, if you do it, you could do a search for it, and I'm sure you'll find it. There's plenty of links on YouTube where people have grabbed it, but this is this is just awful <laughs> in so many ways. I mean, pe- people have been built out of their money, but this is like about people being, you know, built out of their, uh, I don't know, their their minds. <laughs> their um, this uh, Ilya Lichtenstein and and Heather Morgan, um, they're two. I guess they're two personalities unfortunately they became kind of criminal personalities uh or at least allegedly i don't you know they haven't been tried yet but we'll see how that goes but you know i i don't care i'm trying them right now for this video i i say guilty because it's (laughs) it's awful i mean it's it's like you would think someone who who stole this much money this much cryptocurrency would have the means and the funds to produce something like worth watching but it's if you you know you, you'll hear it and you'll see it and it's um it's a pretty terrible attempt at a rap video and trying to be cool and throwing in catch words and all these things i mean maybe it's a parody maybe they're kind of laughing at themselves but i i can't i don't really get that i i all i see is someone that's struggling to be taken seriously and just falling flat on their face yeah <laughs> I started to think maybe we should come up with a, a cyber coast to coast rap or something. We, we could do better than these guys. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous. And, and, and then I start to think maybe it's, it's tied in with, I think they had dual citizenship. They're American and Russian citizenship. They're tech entrepreneurs. And, and I think she described herself as a serial entrepreneur and a comedic rapper Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just, I just was embarrassed for them the whole time. I just sitting there going, Oh, foul <laughs> language. The raps didn't really rhyme very well. The dancing was horrific. <laughs> yeah. It was every, definitely every, a white, a white people rap, you know, it yeah, just did not have the rhythm. <laughs> it was just embarrassing. It was embarrassing for them. So any event, they may, I guess they're a lot better cyber criminals than they are uh, comedians and rappers. Let's leave it at that perhaps. Yeah, I, I suppose. But it just, you know, it just goes to underscore the volatility of crypto. I mean, yeah. 
when this uh, this Bitfinex hacking occurred, Bitcoin plunged 20% just based on this one hacking incident. I mean, could you imagine if the US dollar or your stock portfolio or whatever, something, it plunged 20% because of one criminal's activities? I mean, that's why I, for now I'm staying away from crypto because it's not that I don't trust it. It's just, I don't trust myself with it. Like, I don't know, you don't know what could possibly happen. Yep. It, it is such a roller coaster and I call it an out of control roller coaster. The stock market, at least at the end of the day, you, you look at it and say, okay, even if it is people that do insider trading or manipulate it a little bit, this or that, there's an actual tangible asset, a company maybe with products or services evaluation with a bank account with shareholders the, the physical building with things there, there's something there that you can make a tangible connection to with cryptocurrency it's a lot harder a lot more of a stretch and on top of it it's it's fluctuation it is so erratic it's hard to follow from day to day and it's very reactive to stories like this to, to these large heists when they're billions of dollars it, it sends the uh the price of crypto and Bitcoin specifically into it, just a, a tailwind. It's spinning down and down and then it pops up. And I think there's so many day traders that are jumping in and out to it. it it's just a super risk. Anybody that does want to dive into cryptocurrency, I always tell them, do your homework, um, start out slow, only use what I call funny money, money that you don't do not need to pay your bills, that you don't need for retirement, that you need for food. Something that if tomorrow it was totally gone, it would not affect your your life or your families. Then maybe you want to dip your, your toes into it. And, and that's the high risk part of your portfolio, perhaps. So make sure that you're diversifying it with some cash in the bank and maybe stocks, maybe real estate. And again, I'm not trying to give financial advice to people, but only throw out caution because the sheer number of cryptocurrency heists that are going on out there is very alarming. And of course, we've talked about this in the past. There's no SEC behind cryptocurrency. There's no regulators. It's decentralized. There's no insurance to protect you. And they're starting at some of the exchanges where you might buy or sell crypto to have insurance policies and things in place and some level of assurances for customers. But it's it's a scary thing, and I don't know if you noticed if you watched the the Super Bowl this year, um, mm -hmm. uh, there was a number of cryptocurrency companies that spent significant amount of money for some of their commercials, and, and in my opinion, it was to calm consumers and help them see that hey, crypto is new, it's hot, you can kind of use it to buy and buy things. But it's also cool to invest in and it is safe and secure, I think was kind of the, the underlying message that it's a hip thing and especially appealing to the younger crowd. That's the sense I got from some of these commercials. Yeah, I think the, that's definitely the marketing message. But any crypto investors I've come across, I think it, it almost goes beyond speculation. It's like it's it really is the definition of get rich quick. You know, yeah. they want to do the minimum amount of uh, research, the minimum amount of due diligence. They don't care if the crypto has a bad name on, they don't, they don't really care about the product that the crypto represents or, or anything. They just want to get really quick returns on their investment, if that's what you can call it. And that's, that, you know, that's, that's human nature. And we all fall prey to that at, from time to time. But I think that's the the biggest problem I have with uh, crypto. It just it, it just creates a when you have that many investors um, trying to get rich quick, it creates a really wild ride. And you're always and the the rich are going to get richer, and the poor and the middle class I think are only going to lose their shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, you have to have in any type of those type of things where I, I don't want to classify it as a scam, but it's almost scam like a percentage of the people that are going to be re handsomely rewarded and, and, you know, get a thousand times return on their money. And there's got to be that many more people that lose their shirts, as you say, just to, to keep the business model of, of it flowing, I guess, so it can has some life and continues on. But 
it seems like I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I want to get into crypto. And I say, well, before you do it, say another word. Can I ask why? Oh, I heard you can make a lot of money really quick. It's, it, it is a get rich quick type of conversation that most people have gotten into. And, and some of the people have pulled back. I know you could buy a Tesla with crypto and a lot of other things that make it kind of edgy and cool and fun. But some of the places that initially accepted crypto have had to back up, especially when you look at the volatility of it, what you're buying and versus selling and what you're paying for it, it, it changes by, by the day to day. So it's hard to say, well, I need to sell it for this much because the value of it's this much than tomorrow crypto rockets up $10,000 per Bitcoin or something. And, and you say, wait a minute, it's difficult to, to justify. Yeah. Yeah, crazy stuff. Uh, and and see, see, see where that, that story goes with that couple as it unfolds more. But um, glad they were caught. Um, and, and, and I should, should point out, glad that the majority of the laundered stolen funds um, have been, I guess, collected and, and traced. So congratulations to law enforcement for, again, doing a great job. I, I'm noticing the Justice Department and uh, FBI, Secret Service, the different agencies working together um, are doing a better and better job. And we look at what's happening in the world of cybersecurity and, and CISA, many other organizations. They're starting to make cyber criminals sweat. They're making it harder for them to not just get away with what they're doing, but they're now catching them. They're recovering funds, even in the world of cryptocurrency, where there's an allure of um, anonymity and you can't catch me and they're bragging these kind of cyber criminal media stars, I guess you could say with all these crazy gangs that they're in these cyber criminal gangs, but um, they can only go so far. And I'm glad to see that sometimes they will lose and sometimes they could be made an example of. And I think this terrible rap video will, will be <laughs> what we remember about these two fools more than anything else. <laughs> right on. Yeah, great. Well, the next, uh, before we dive into the next story here, just as a friendly reminder to our, our, our listening base here, which is growing, by the way, every week, we're having more and more downloads of uh, Cyber Coast to Coast. And this episode of Cyber Coast to Coast is brought to you by Cyberlytica, proactive cyber crime intelligence is what they provide. And to learn more about Cyberlytica, visit cyberlytica.com. Okay, this next right. and final story here comes from the Hacker News. Uh, Craig, this was a really cool one. I really enjoyed it. In fact, I already shared it with some coworkers. Billy and I were reading it earlier and laughing because I, I thought it was just a great, a great story here. And it talks about a new tool that can retrieve pixelated text from redacted documents. Hmm. Um, and I, I, I just love things like this where they're using technology and tying it into uh, security and helping us better understand what are ways to stay secure. And I think probably... You know, I don't know how you feel about it, but if somebody asked me, um, hey, if a document is, is redacted and it, the, the fonts are all blurred out, is that safe? And, and does that make it secure? And my first gut instinct would say, yeah, a, a, lot, a lot more secure than um, just taking a pen and maybe striking a line through it because you can kind of take your eyes and peer through and put together some of it. So any, any standouts that you really liked about this article? Uh, well, first, I'd like, I like to urge um, anyone to see it for themselves on, on the hackernews.com. And, and the link will be posted in our show notes so they could follow it directly there. Um, you can see it at work, like a, a demonstration of this thing. And it's really kind of a marvel because I remember looking at um, pixelated or mosaic uh, images of, you know, when they have someone will testify in secrecy or something like that on TV. And I always thought that, you know, if I just like squint my eyes just enough, I could kind of make out, I could see their face. I, I swear I could see who they are. And this almost sort of proves that, <laughs> that theory, but it uses, you know, kind of advanced, you know, artificial intelligence to kind of go through and, and say, well, the neck, if, if this was, if, if this is the letter here and we know what a clear letter looks like, we can approximate what the next letter is going to be. And it just kind of goes down letter by letter and, and decodes these, um, um, these uh, uh, pixelated phrases. And, and it's, it really impressed me. Um, uh, Dan was Dan Petro. 
uh, from a security firm Bish, called Bishop Fox. He's the one who demonstrated this. And it's an open source tool called Unredactor. Um, but I guess, I guess my takeaway is almost, you know, in the end, nothing's safe. I mean, the only thing that's safe when you redact something is to just sh either delete it completely or strike through with a large, you know, the thick black marker, like you see on all those, you know, federal papers when they want to redact things. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, what, yeah, do you, what do you think? Pretty cool. I, I was, I thought he did a great job on the video demonstrating it too, which is kind of embedded in the middle of the, the Hacker News editorial piece there. So I encourage people to check out the link and watch the video because it is hard to describe something very visual through through means such as this audio podcast. But when you watch the video, it the light bulb goes out. And, and I think I agree with you. We're, as humans, we're actually great in a sense, uh, example of an artificial intelligence i always look at because we can actually look at things and kind of piece things together with our our vision fill in the blanks as it were um so our brains do some amazing things in connection with our vision and but this algorithm takes it to the next step now they they do talk i think in more detail as you dig into the article because right away the 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 pessimist in me is trying to either debunk it or ask myself, well, if I was a bad guy, how would I get around this? And um, so they, they mentioned there that the threat model works on a given piece of text containing both redacted and unredacted information. And that the, uh, the, the attacker uses the information about the font size and the type that's gleaned from clear text to actually predict the concealed information. Mm -hmm. so, so I started to wander in my mind and I got to think about it some more maybe, what would happen if the text had multiple font sizes or different kernings where, where the spacing is, is a little bit inconsistent um, and or pictures in the midst of it and things like that? Um, what starts to happen to it? I don't know. It'd be interesting. Um, but I, I guess it's really, in a sense, it's this algorithm that they developed and there's some AI part of it as well that, that allows it to really uh, do this. But, but to your point, I think, you, like you said, if you want to keep any type of text safe, number one, you either have to properly redact it by having it completely blacked out and really a box that can completely um, prevent you from seeing any size of font and thickness and all the other things there. So it's a hundred percent blocked out and, and, or you got to go back to old school, which I think is still very effective uh, using a micro cross cut uh, shredder that unfortunately that destroys the entire document, not just the part that's, that's redacted. But if you want to preserve and, or I shouldn't say not preserve, you want to destroy a document completely because there is sensitive information in there, proprietary or confidential, that that's a real effective way, obviously burning something completely, but using a micro cross cut shredder to just obliterate it is another way. But there are documents that you really want to preserve, say 90% of it, but there's 10% that has to be redacted, that, that's where you want to properly do it, where you just black out entirely that section that you don't want to ever be visualized. Yeah. And um, this is one of the few times where I really wish our podcast was a, you know, delivered as a visual because we could include that. Um, so of course I'm ur urging people uh, to go, you know, go check out the hacker news and see it for yourself. But one way to, I guess, an or <laughs> audible description it it reminds me of um hashing you know a little bit because you got you, you got things that are hashed or sort of encrypted but if they're not hashed uh, uh completely or appropriately it's quite possible to reverse hash them and we've seen this demonstrated from time to time time and time again um by uh hackers and so that's, that's the, to me, that's the closest approximation of what I'm thinking uh, this could uh, be compared to in, the not, you know, in a non-visual way. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's a good, good uh, comparison there. But again, I think no matter how much we talk about it, this is one of those things I read the article, then I had to reread it. Until I saw the video, it didn't click with myself personally. So again, go to the go to the article really to dig in and kind of get, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on it or give us, give us some feedback, what, what their take is on it uh, after watching the video and, re and reading the article, but it was some great research, I think. And that's, um, I think what's important. I, I always love to 
do a shout out to those in the, in the cybersecurity community that are researchers that are not just reporting on information, but doing research and trying to, uh, you know, find vulnerabilities, find weaknesses, find ways of exploiting technology before the hackers do to make things safer and to inform us all how to stay safe. That's a really important part of it because would you have ever thought about this? Probably not. I know I didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. now I understand it much better and I'll be thinking about it in the future when I have documents that I maybe normally would just use a strikeout feature on it. And uh, now I'm going to be a little bit uh, more careful, I think. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, uh, again, as we kind of wind down, I just want to remind our, our listeners, this episode of Cyber Coast to Coast is brought to you by Cyberlytica. Cyberlytica provides proactive cybercrime intelligence. And to learn more about Cyberlytica, visit cyberlytica.com. We thank them as a sponsor for our uh, segment here of Cyber Coast to Coast. Thanks again to our listeners. And if you're enjoying these uh, weekly uh, episodes of our podcast, Cyber Coast to Coast, please take a minute to share it with your friends and uh, give us a little review. Go, go, go online and give us a review and let us know your thoughts. What, what type of things would you like to hear more of or less of? More jokes, more music, more mm -hmm. cyber, more hacking, more tips. We're here to, to, to keep our audience happy. So thanks again for tuning in. And this is uh, Scott Schober here on the East Coast signing out for Another episode of Cyber Coast to Coast. Stay safe. Cyber. Coast to Coast. Cyber. Coast to Coast.